I hope you can read a couple verses there with me in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And in particular, we're going to start in verse 3. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. It says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That verse makes it real clear that God wants everybody to be saved. In other words, He wants hell to be empty. He wants it to be empty. He doesn't want a single individual to be lost everyone to be saved. Now, that's good news. He said much the same thing in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Peter's talking about the end of the world, the destruction of the world. He says in verse 9 of 2 Peter chapter 3, <clears throat> The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't want a single person to perish, not a single one. He wants everybody to come to repentance. So at the very outset, when we're looking at why some people won't be saved, it is not because of God. In other words, God desires that every person be saved. But in spite of that, in spite of it being God's will, the Bible says some people won't be saved. It's not because Jehovah hasn't made salvation available to everybody, because He has. But it's because He doesn't force salvation on anyone doesn't force anyone to come to repentance, doesn't force anyone to believe, doesn't force anyone to obey. He gives them a choice. So why then will some not be saved? The first category is one of the, the saddest, I think, and it's those who do not want to be saved. You mean there are people who don't want to be saved? There sure are. But we have to understand that the Bible says that God calls people through the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, this was made very clear to the church at Thess Thessalonica. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which He called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. How did He call us? Through the gospel. We're called to sanctification. We're called to salvation. We're called to the truth. We're called to the obtaining of the glory. How? Through the gospel. Did he have to do it that way? I suppose not, but that's what he said he did. He calls people to salvation through the gospel. He does not call them by sending an angel. He does not call them by a dream or a vision or a revelation. No, he calls people exclusively through the gospel. That is the only way. Why? Why? Well, when Paul wrote to the church at Rome, he told the church at Rome why. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Faith. Where is the power? It says it's in the gospel. It has the power, the energy, to save. And this invitation, this calling, is not to a, a select few. It's not to just some random number of people. It is to everyone. Jesus made this clear. Matthew chapter 11 
Jesus said this invitation is to everyone. Matthew chapter 11, <clears throat> we'll begin reading in verse 28. Matthew chapter 11. Notice that this invitation is extended to every single person. Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 28. These are this is Jesus talking. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy as my burden is light. How many people can come to him? Who is he saying, come to me? All you who labor and are heavy laden. Anyone. That invitation, that call is extended to every single person. Everyone we meet, everyone that that uh, is in our family, everyone that, that's a friend of ours, everyone that we works with, we work with, everyone has that invitation extended to them. Why? Because God wants every single person to be saved. But some people have no interest in answering that call. They have no interest in it at all. Jesus told a parable in Matthew chapter 22 that describes some of the attitudes of people. Matthew chapter 22. We'll begin reading in verse 1. <clears throat> and we'll see that there are people who are unconcerned. There are people who are indifferent. There are people who just don't care about answering that call. Matthew chapter 22 verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables. And said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who were invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their cities. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out to the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Notice in the parable that the king arranges the marriage, he sends out his servants to call those to the wedding and some were not willing to come. God has sent out the call. He sent it out through the gospel. Some were simply not willing to come. They are not going to answer the invitation. And there might be a number of reasons, but they're not going to respond. Maybe they're simply indifferent. They just don't care. Well, others, he sent out other servants, tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner. Come to the wedding. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. Others are not going to respond to the invitation because they have other things to do. See, some went to the farm, some went to their business. They had more important things to do in their own mind than answer the invitation. They had to make a living or they had to work on their farm. They had to increase their business or they had this or that. There were other things to them that were more important. So they just weren't concerned about it. Their priorities weren't right. Some were mad that they were even invited. Yeah, they were angry. They were so angry that they treated the servants spitefully and killed them. The invitation goes out. The, the invitation is extended. The call goes out. Some people not only are indifferent and unconcerned, but some people get angry that there's even an invitation. And notice that all of these people who refused the invitation, who didn't accept the call, 
have a very bleak future. A very bleak future. And that's true today. Why some people won't be saved. Some people simply aren't concerned. They're indifferent. They don't care about it. They're concerned about their farm, their business, their life, and that's it. In other words, their whole existence just centers around the here and now, this world, and that's all. And Jesus is very clear those people won't be saved. They're going to spend it in outer darkness, he later says in this chapter, weeping and gnashing of teeth. But it wasn't because they, they weren't invited. It wasn't because they weren't called. They just simply said, no, we don't want that. We don't want what you have. So we're saying, no, we're not coming to that wedding feast. Why some people won't be saved? Well, some people, also unfortunately, a large number of people, believe that their goodness will save them by itself. And that's all they have to do. They just have to be good. Jesus went to great lengths to show people that good works can't save you. Over and over and over, him and the writers of the New Testament emphasized that good works are not the basis for anybody being saved. Even the very beginning of his teaching ministry, Jesus made this clear. Go back with me to Matthew 7. Jesus emphasizes this. Matthew 7, notice verse 21. <clears throat> Matthew 7, verse 21 and following. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Not even wonderful works. See, they, they did wonders. But those by themselves simply can't save anyone. In other words, it's not like a, a, a balance where you put your good deeds on one side and your bad deeds on the other. If you have one bad deed on one side, it's over. It's all it takes to cast you into hell is one bad deed. That's it. It doesn't make any difference if you've got a million good deeds on the other side. That's not sufficient to save you. Why? Because good works can't save anyone. That's why they don't have the power. See, man by himself is not capable of directing his own steps. That's what Jeremiah said. Turn back to Jeremiah chapter 10. Notice verse 23 of that chapter. <clears throat> the Lord, of course, is speaking through Jeremiah. These are words of inspiration. Uh, Jeremiah says in the 10th chapter, verse 23, O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. See, man doing what he thinks is right and good cannot save. It is not in man to know what to do. He must be told. So man's not capable of saving himself. He's not capable of getting rid of, cleansing his sins. In Isaiah 64, Isaiah has this to say. Isaiah 64, notice verse 6 and 7. Isaiah 64, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah says... <clears throat> But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. We cannot, by our good works, go take hold of God. 
It's impossible. Why? Because of our filthy garments, our iniquities, our transgressions, our unrighteousnesses. We can't do it. So these passages show us that being good doesn't have the power to save because good works have no power. They have no power in and of themselves to save. It's impossible, regardless of how many good deeds there are. Unfortunately, our world says otherwise. Our world looks at people, and if they see them doing something good, they will, that person, you know, they've got it made. They're, they're going to heaven. They're going to be with God. has nothing to do with good works at all. Good works can't take anyone to heaven. It's impossible. So what can? Well, the Bible's clear about that too. One has to trust in Christ's sacrifice and be redeemed by his blood. Paul said this, Romans chapter 5. Paul wanted the church of Rome to be crystal clear in their understanding about what's saved and what doesn't. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, <clears throat> Paul writes this, But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Notice there's a couple of things in this passage. Number one, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. See, it wasn't because we were good that he died for us. He died for us because we were bad. We were sinners. And much more than we are now justified by his blood. Later on in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, he would say that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because they were justified by his blood. Not justified by their good works. Not justified, justified because they fed the hungry or housed the homeless or visited the people in prison. Yeah, those are things we're to do, but they don't save anyone. They have no power. Where's the power? It's in the blood. How do I know that? Because the gospel tells me that. See, the gospel invites me. It wants me to be justified by his blood. That's God's desire. He doesn't desire to save us by good works. He desires us to be saved by the blood of his son. That's why Jesus had to die. If we could be saved by good works, then his death is meaningless. In Ephesians chapter 1 Starts a long section, a section there in Ephesians about blessings in Christ. Notice what verse 7 says of Ephesians chapter 1. It says, in him, in Christ, that's the context of the verse before, in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We're redeemed and justified and forgiven based upon his blood, not based upon our good works. So all of those people who think they're going to be saved by good works are actually lost because those good works cannot get rid of sin. It's impossible. The third category, this even includes people in the body of Christ. Some people are going to be lost because they refuse to turn from their sins. Jesus and the apostles and the writers of the New Testament repeatedly talked about the need for repentance. The Bible says there's only one thing that separates man from God, and that is man's sin. In Isaiah 59... The prophet says this in the first two verses. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. 
Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. See, it, it's not because God can't hear or save. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. He says the problem is your sin. The problem is your iniquities, your transgressions. That's what separates man from God. And there's only one thing that has the power to get rid of those sins, and that is the blood of Christ. That's why Christ suffered and died on the cross. He suffered and died on the cross to save people from sin, not save people in their sin. Huge difference between those two things. He died to save people from sin, not in sin. In Romans chapter 6, Paul makes that point in verse 11. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. He tells the church in Rome this in the 11th verse. He says, Likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. So Christ came to save people from sin. Not to save us while we are in sin and continue to be in sin. That was not his purpose. So to fail to repent of our sins is to fail to turn away from sin. Jesus on numerous occasions said repent or perish. Repent or perish. Over and over again he knew the need for repentance. I think it's the hardest thing for man to do because of our nature. Because it, 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 first of all, we have to admit we're wrong. And, and who, who likes to do that? You have to admit you're wrong, and then you have to be sorry for it. You have to admit you're wrong, and then you have to be sorry for it. And that sorrow, that grief, leads one to repentance. So everyone stands at the brink of spiritual death until repentance occurs. Because it's impossible for one to be saved who refuses to turn from their sins. It's impossible. The blood of Christ can't save anyone who refuses to turn from their sin. It's not possible. That's why Peter said, you know, in Acts 2, you have to repent and be baptized. Being baptized has no power, no significance or relevance without repentance. It's just getting wet. Repentance, it's absolutely essential. But we've seen that even though God wants all men to be saved, and he does... He wants everybody to come to repentance. He doesn't want anybody to be lost. We know that many will be. Jesus said many are going to be lost because they choose that wide, easy way. It's a wide, easy way. And that's the way that most people are going to choose. But he's left it us to up, uh, up to us. He has called us. He's invited us. He's extended that invitation to everybody. And he's left it up to us. Which road shall we choose? Because it's entirely up to us. He wants everybody to be saved. And at the same time, he knows that many will not be. Not because of him, but because they choose not to be. And what's our choice? Are we choosing to be saved? The Bible says that after one is immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins, that they can lose that salvation by not living according to God's word. So this morning, if you're in need of 
of help, if you're in need of repentance, confession, if you're in need of prayer, then we want you to come as we stand and sing this song. Let's stand, please.